Um, so this is a, a, a complete run um, of basically the way from the, from the hotel up to the observatory. And I tried to, ca to catch that on camera. Unfortunately, I couldn't attach it somewhere to the car, so it's actually quite shaky because I held it in my hand for most of, it, for most of the time. It's a gravel road, so it's really, really bumpy up there. And some people actually get travel sick on the way up because the, the four-wheel drive cars, they kind of shift and swim around. It's actually quite weird. Um, it's quite dangerous, isn't it? It actually is dangerous, yeah. So, um, the, the, I mean, the, the car rental companies, there's no way that you, they would allow you up there with a rental car. Um, there's some crazy people who still go up in two-wheel drive cars, which is, um, yeah, it's very, very edgy. And uh, they are struggling up there as well. Um, most people just go in four-wheel drive cars and... Um, yeah, so the reason it's the, the road is not paved is kind of also to keep people out because otherwise there would be thousands of cars up on the summit, and um, of course they do interfere with the with the telescopes because of the lights and uh, the pollution and uh, the, the probably also the shaking of its big cars. Yeah, so so the working day starts sort of late afternoon where you do all your preparations, you get ready for the night ahead. You might have dinner, drive up to the telescope. Um, as the sun's setting, you need to open the dome so that the telescope temperature, in, the air temperature inside the dome equalizes, so you don't have turbulence. For me, that was always quite a thrilling part. I always like to go into the dome itself um, and, and actually watch the dome open and feel the whole machinery shake and then maybe peek out. And, and again, if, if, if you're on Mauna Kea, you can often consider yourself that you're the highest person in the whole Pacific at that moment. You know, that, that's quite, a, quite an exciting thought. Um, and then as long as everything's going well, you often pop out to watch the sunset. Take, we've got tons and tons of pictures of beautiful, beautiful sunsets. Um, and then it's back inside, and, and usually you start off by doing calibration frames, um, getting, getting, taking data that you'll need later on to make sense of the, of the rest of the data that you're going to take, and then you jump straight into your science program. And again, every moment is precious, so you've often got this planned out in advance, and you just want to execute things as fast as you can, as efficiently as you can, until the sun comes up again. And then you, f you do another set of calibrations. Uh, you make sure your data is safely stored on tape or on disk or whatever you're using. Um, drive back down. If you feel up to it, you might have a, a breakfast. But, but uh, often you just roll right into bed, pull the blinds down, put a do not disturb sign on your door, and try to get as much sleep as you can before it starts all over again. So the, the, the way UCURT works, the telescope works, um, other than other telescopes, so there, there are telescopes in Chile or so where you write an application and you get allocated the time and you go there and take the, take the actual data for your work or for, for the proposal that you've written. Um, UCURT is different. UCURT um, has so-called queue observing. Um, so all the projects that have been allocated um, time, um, they are in a computer. And uh, basically, you put in the observing conditions, um, so the seeing and the, the brightness and the object. So depending on summer, winter, some objects are up, some are not. Some are too low on the horizon that you can't actually observe them. Um, and basically, the computer tells you what you can, uh, what you have to observe, or what you can observe, and you can just pick your favorite one. Uh, which again, you know, it's it's actually quite an easy work and. Um, I think still the reason why we are flying there and why we are observing is more a security thing because for security reasons there have to be two people up there so that's the telescope operator and at least one observer. Um, the problem is because it has to be two um, they can either fly in people, observers, like they currently do um, or they hire a few more people for the telescope. At more telescope operators basically. It turns out that flying people in seems to be less expensive than actually hiring people. So that's, I think, ba the basic reason why we still go. Uh, it certainly is dangerous and there have been astronomers who have lost their lives at observatories, which is very, very sad. Um, people building the telescopes as well have, have had accidents. Um, so we do have to be very careful when, when we're up there. Um, for myself personally, uh, when I lived in Hawaii, one time I was driving back from the observatory 
and our car actually hit a wild pig, <laughs> which was a bit uh, a bit of an experience. Um, there. Are, to explain that. Well, there are wild wild boars running around the island, um, and you're out in the middle of nowhere. It's the middle of the night. It's dark. Uh, we were coming down off the mountain. Actually, it was still in the dark. We were heading home, um, back down to sea level, um, and we had an unfortunate encounter with a pig. <laughs> Made rather a mess of the car. <laughs> oh no. It's it, well the, the whole the whole environment is very very surreal. So it's um, it's this completely moon or Mars shaped um, environment. Um, it's very very dry. Usually the humidity is um, apart from when it's cloudy, of course. Um, but usually it's like one percent humidity. So you really really drink a lot, uh, which also have you know you have to go to the toilet a lot. Um, you yeah, it's, it's completely strange because you really you drink so much actually that you have to force yourself to drink because you know you dehydrate faster than you would actually fill it up. Um, you have a headache because it's quite high up and it is so dry um, some of the time. So they've got a big big cupboard full of aspirin which where you're free to use and uh, yeah we did that a lot. Oh, I did a lot. Um, yeah, I mean you can see in, the, in that video that's just yeah it's a stone desert. Really, it's it's a completely harsh landscape. For me, being an astronomer was all about going observing, going to the telescopes and gathering your data. So we don't have labs that we can work in and do experiments. This is where we go and do the hard work and gather the data and then come back and, yeah, spend months sitting in front of our computer analyzing the data. And for me, part of the whole romance about being an observational astronomer was actually going out to use the telescopes in these exotic parts of the world. That's changing a bit these days. The, the way we do science is changing quite a lot. And in fact, they're becoming less and less frequent, these observing trips, for several reasons. Either the way the telescope is scheduled in order to be more efficient means that you don't know when your observations are going to be taken. Um, so your observations sit in a queue and when the conditions are right uh, they execute your instructions for you. And this is good, it means you have a better chance of getting your data taken, um, but it also means you miss out on the, on the opportunity to actually go in and press the buttons. <coughs> Well, to be honest, I don't get to go observing very much anymore, which makes me a bit sad. I did most of my observing as a student. Now either I get my, my time through this service mode where it's done on your behalf, or I use telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope where you're not really going to get a chance to go up and uh, press any buttons. Um, so again, it means that there's lots of data available, but you know, for me personally, I don't have as many opportunities to go in person to the telescope as I used to. So it's still a thrill for me. You know, I'm not one of these people who says, oh, I have to go to Hawaii again next week. You know, um, when you get to go, I, I find it exciting. I, I find it, you get a real connection with, with what it is that you're doing. Um, and you get to travel to these wonderful exotic places. Being on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, it, it really does feel like you're out of this world. It's, it's, it's not like any other place on Earth. Uh, in fact, it's more like Mars than any, anywhere else. Um, and just the excitement of, you know, the sun goes down, the clock starts ticking, you have a very limited amount of time to get your work done um, until before the sun comes up again. Sometimes um, the telescopes are dedicated to very, very large surveys. So rather than executing one particular astronomer or one particular group of astronomers set of instructions or bit of research, they decide to pool the resources of the telescope and do usually a public survey um, so that will take up a huge fraction of the telescope time, but the data will be available immediately to the public, to, 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 to the astronomical community. Um, but you still need people there to actually do the work of the observing. So in that sense, yes, yeah, sometimes we send people out just to, just to fill the chair uh, and, and do this observing. Can't this all be done automatically now by all you clever scientists? Can't they just automate these telescopes? Some are actually automated. We have some robotic telescopes. Uh, and in the future, I think we'll see less and less of people getting hands-on experience 
um, actually going in and, and using the telescope for their own personal observing programs. Um, but in the meantime, we're in this intermediate phase where sometimes it is appropriate for us to go out. Um, and, and I'm glad about that because that's, that's the exciting part of it. That's the fun part of it. Um, observing um, is absolute fun, so um, I would love to do it more. Uh, well, the problem is a bit um, because it takes out a chunk of your of your time because you you, you spend the time to travel. You're high up, so um, you actually either you can't concentrate and uh, you, you're not very effective in working, um, or you actually um, have to work at the telescope. So you kind of lose time for your scientific part. Um, but it's certainly much more fun than sitting in Nottingham in front of a computer and writing computer programs. Well, so um, yeah. I would love to do it more, but unfortunately I can't. So We're just writing a proposal for a telescope in Chile, so I'm uh, optimistic we get that time, and uh, I hope I can go. But you take sure. Chile with you, will you? Can I come to Chile with you? Uh, if I go, you can certainly come with me, yeah? Okay. <laughs> I'll hold you to <laughs> if that. It, if it <laughs> well, I, I do remember an interesting experience in, in Hawaii being in altitude, and it actually wasn't at Mauna Kea, it was on Haleakala, which is the highest mountain on Maui, the next island over. And there are also observatories there. I happened to be there as a tourist. And as a tourist, the thing that you do is go up to watch the sunset from up there. It's a little lower, it's only 10,000 feet. But as we were standing there in the dark, um, we saw an enormous fireball float through the sky. And I can't say how long it took, but it, was, it lasted easily long enough for our whole group to say, wow, look at that, and everyone to turn around and have a good long look at this thing. But the amazing thing about that was because we were at altitude, it was actually happening below us. We were looking down on this fireball streaking through the atmosphere. And that's certainly one memory that I take back from, from observing at altitude. Any idea what that might have been? Oh, it was, it was, it was a meteor of some sort. Um, probably much smaller than we expect, probably not much bigger than a grain of sand, probably didn't hit the ground, um, but it made a pretty spectacular show on the way down.